Good evening. Welcome to the School of Architecture's Monday evening lecture series. Uh, you'll notice we're not in a school and it's not Monday, but we are very happy to be able to reorganize our lecture series to coincide uh, with the visiting ACSA uh, West Central Conference. And so I also want to especially welcome all the uh, participants and attendees for the uh, ACSA Conference. Uh, it's great to have you here and welcome you again. Um, uh, there will be a couple of other public events over the next two days. Um, uh, the ACSA, you want to know the ACSA people are? There are the very expensive seats in the front. You don't know how much more comfortable these seats are. <laughs> these seats are at least $300 tickets down there, uh, except for the late ones. <laughs> um, yeah, they're nice though, right? They're nice seats. They're really nice seats down there. <laughs> Uh, there are a couple of other public events um, in addition to Neil's lecture tonight uh, for those of you north of the equator. Um, uh, tomorrow night at 6 o'clock will be the second keynote address by Jeff Kipnis, uh, who's a member of our faculty, um, occasionally teaches other places. Um, and there will be another uh, public event Saturday at 1100 in the uh, uh, architecture building, a panel discussion with Monica Ponce de Leon who is the Dean of the Talbot College of Architecture at the University of Michigan, uh, Michael Speaks, who is the Dean of the College of Design at the University of Kentucky, uh, and Sarah Whiting, Dean of the School of Architecture at Rice University. Uh, and that is at uh, 4 o'clock on Saturday. So those are the three public events. Tonight, it's a great pleasure to be able to open uh, the conference with Neil Denari, uh, someone we appreciate having around the school as much as possible. Uh, two and a half years ago, for those of you who were here then, uh, you remember that Neil did a brilliant workshop uh, as our Greenwald Visiting Chair uh, entitled Altered Chicago, which smashed many of the existing preconceptions uh, about what the city, this city and cities in general could be, simply by rearranging its own material and rescripting its potential stories. Uh, I will repeat the facts that Neil has heard and you have heard two years ago, but for the facts, Neil is a Texan. Uh, he's born in Fort Worth. Uh, receiving his B.R. from the University of Houston and then an M.R. from Harvard. In 1986, at the age of 29, he was the youngest member named to the 40 Under 40 Architects. In 1986, he moved to L.A., where he set up his own office and served as director of the Southern California School of Architecture, SciArc, from 1997 <coughs> to 2001. Since leaving SciArc, Neil has been a professor, a professor at UCLA, where I had uh, the great opportunity to teach Neil alongside Neil. Uh, and realize that he is not only one of the uh, greatest architectural talents, uh, or one of the most underrated architects uh, around, but he's also an incredibly dedicated and talented teacher. In addition to UCLA, Neil has also uh, held visiting positions at Princeton and Berkeley, and he's currently, and uh, my condolences, uh, teaching at the GSD. Uh, his work has been published uh, everywhere internationally, and collected in two of his monographs, um, Interrupted Projections and Gyroscopic Horizons. In 2002, he received the Richard Riccio Award and the Samuel Morris Medal for Architecture from the National Academy of Design for distinguished work in the field. Last year, he won a United States Artist Fellowship, uh, equally distinguished, uh, making UIC count three. Um, Andy Zaga, who was a Greenwald Chair, Neil, and Doug Garofalo. So if you want a USA Fellowship, come here to teach. Uh, it's coming next, I'm sure. You're on the list. They have a critic category. Um, last May, uh, Neil's early drawings were featured in an exhibition called The Artless Drawn, held at the Ace Gallery in LA, and his long-awaited HL23 tower along the High Line in New York is coming to completion as well. Uh, I'm not sure that there's any architect over the last 20 years who's been more knocked off than Neil, uh, but in the 10 years between installation at the Gallery Ma and his more recent work such as the Endeavor Talent Agency in LA. Uh, it's been clear to everyone that Neil not only invented what Jeff would call the single surface problem, uh, but that I would say uh, has, uh, it's with Neil that it's achieved its highest degrees of elegance and resolution. Uh, and maybe in terms of the conference, that's also one sense of the flip your field, uh, which is to say to turn up the horizontal surface to become legible and imageable. 
uh, not to be embarrassed by architecture, not try to have architecture mimic uh, invisible horizontal expansions such as landscape and infrastructure. Uh, it's unapologetically designed, uh, but also designed that nonetheless uh, rechannels the invisible forces and desires around it. Uh, Neil's able to combine a couple of traits that are possibly singular in the field. Uh, he's uh, relentless consistency in the work and its preoccupations, combined with a perpetual sense of surprise in what the results are. And I think that's because he's an architect's architect, uh, as well as an unabashed purveyor and a connoisseur, really, of popular <coughs> culture in all genres. Uh, Neil and I have an ongoing competition to name obscure early 70s B-movies, typically science fiction movies, uh, and we are also the founding members of the Eric Braden fan club. Um, go Wiki it. Uh, uh, I think he's in The Young and the Restless, is what you would know him as, but we know him from the Rat Patrol and Colossus the Forbin Project. Uh, um, Neil has no competitors in the, the accomplishments of translating, uh, or maybe Jeff Kibnis would call it reoriginating, uh, media and graphic spaces to precise architectural problems practically inventing an entirely new form of plastic detail and tectonics, one that's at once optimistic and fresh without any glimmer of commentary or looking back. In other words, he's, for our purposes, as we said earlier, hardcore <coughs> and flip. Uh, so if we ever do become uh, or approach becoming the Huskadu School of Architecture, it will be because of part of our association with architecture's Bob Mould, go wiki that also, Neil Denard. <laughs> Precise form for an imprecise world already suggests that um, something has shifted uh, over 15 or 20 years. You remember in the 90s when fuzziness and the blur was the project, and it, and it was the project because of, let's say, the death of a certain paradigm of, of uh, weight and reference, like modernism in its place was an immaterial world. So the fuzzy not only was what you would do to hold a mirror up to the world to say this is what it's like, so this is the, the work that I'm going to make. It either for some became, you know, an exotic realm of foremaking, or for others it became a way to forestall decision making. And decision making, it would seem, would go into what uh, makes something precise. I would think that you couldn't be undecided about anything and have it be precise. Jeff, we can talk about how that could be a real case, but I would say not. If you, I think, also took a poll of every architect today, no one would say, I'm interested in imprecision today, I'm interested in the fuzzy. Um, partly because digital technology has put out there a kind of idea that in its promise to deliver accuracy and fidelity and um, a kind of numerical uh, finitude, 
that by definition everyone today would be interested in precise, but I'm, I'm also talking about the material project where if you took the poll and everybody said, yeah, I'm interested in being precise, and does that mean that I don't want my building to leak? And 15 years ago, a leaky building was okay. In other words, has precision up the ante on a kind of um, professionalism that you may not want, but it's being forced upon you because it's almost like you don't have any room to, to uh, make a false move. I, I, I kind of want to lay out that idea of the precise um, today, which is you know, represented in this kind of sense of uh, uh, clinical uh, perfection. And I know that's always been something that's been associated in the last six or seven or eight years with the stuff that we've built, and I'll kind of talk about um, you know, what that means. Everybody's got, I suppose, different definitions and dis different aspirations of the nature of, the, of, of what it means to, to operate as, as um, a precise thinker, a precise maker, et cetera. But I want to go through some people in the 20th century to kind of state the problems of precision and for instance, where I'm in related to that. This is Wim Crowell, he's uh, 80 uh, odd years old now, one of the great master modernist uh, graphic designers in, in uh, not only Dutch history, but in, in, in the world of 20th century design, and here's what he said. I don't know if I'm a functionalist who's plagued by form or formalist who's plagued by function. I went to interview him, I took this uh, uh, portrait, I was about two feet away from his face, it was a great conversation. And I said, tell me why you use certain colors. Well, I get a brief, I understand what the project is, I'll use green because such and such. What do you do when you don't know? I use blue. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that's why I'm wearing a blue sweater today, he said. And in fact, he was. So, uh, this kind of moment, and in fact, it wasn't an embarrassing kind of admission, it was probably a sense of, Maybe I prefer not knowing what to do so I can use blue because I love it so much. Because uh, making a kind of deterministic project, doctrinaire project vis-a-vis -vis modernism is uh, becoming less interesting. In 1967, he drew and invented this alphabet called the New Alphabet. And it was for uh, CRT screens in, in airports in the 60s, and his office was involved in doing the graphics for Schiphol, uh, type of a certain kind, even sans serif type, which has curvature on the form, became so pixelated <coughs> you couldn't read it. So he tried to invent a type which got rid of all of the curvature in a type form. He used a, a bevel on the corner and essentially made this kind of gridded uh, alphabet, which he saw would would take on the low res fuzziness of the CRT and somehow be legible. Now this never got implemented and it was totally ironic that he would make a typeface that's illegible in the very ambition to get around the problem of fuzziness with um, even Helvetica type on the screen. Stanley Kubrick, uh, the late great Stanley Kubrick made 13 movies in his life super uh, productive uh, at one level, not in the volumetric Hollywood sense, and here's what he said. When you're making a film, in addition to any higher purpose, you must be interesting. Um, it's pretty interesting. If you saw 2001, maybe you fell asleep. It wasn't interesting enough, maybe, because it was too boring. And so, essentially, Kubrick, in this particular movie, took all of the kind of radical projects of um, people like Warhol and Michael Snow and, and Stan Brakhage and people in, in the 1960s, and the, the most radical project you could make in film was to make it slow. It was the project of anti-action, and in that sense, this movie substituted the spectacle of action for the vivid, and the vivid in terms of the image. And uh, this movie only had 45 pages of dialogue. A Hollywood movie had 110 pages. Dialogue. So it took 45 pages of dialogue in about two hours and 40 minutes. So uh, at one level, for me, this is profound in the way in which the image became obviously <coughs> the spectacle, draining out the interesting aspect of what um, plot usually is in the Hollywood film. No introduction here, and you know what's coming. 
I don't want to be interesting, I want to be good. So this would be a direct counterproposal to Kubrick. Now, if you think about it, would you go to a movie knowing that it was not interesting? There's not. If you read horrible reviews, it's not going to engage me at some level. I wouldn't go. Now, the medium of film is deeply connected to entertainment. In fact, you know, even documentary film, that kind of non-narrative film, better be engaging. So if interesting means uh, attention or attraction, and good means somehow a kind of sense of uh, pragmatics, which could go in one direction into the banal, or into another direction, the beautiful, depending on what your you know, politics are, one would sort of imagine that architecture, for me, is not entertainment. Therefore, it can never be interesting. And for Kubrick, relative to film, it can never just be good, it must always be interesting, and the fault line is it's about entertainment. Miles Davis, here's what he said. I'll play it first, I'll tell you what it is later, man. <laughs> I just want to feel it, I want to make it, and I'll decide when and where and how. I'm, and it, you know what, Miles never told anybody what it was, so he just played it anyway. So on the one hand, this invokes a kind of process where um, precision somehow must be either retroactively uh, extracted from that which is always fuzzy, always um, sort of vague, but in this kind of conundrum he's articulating in time a kind of sense of uh, a fissure between those conditions, basically. Diane Arbus, here's what she said. The more precise you are, the more general it will be. It seems like uh, that means the more you have a mania for, for accuracy in a way, uh, the more the sense that, at least for me as I interpret this, um, the general sense of it will be uh, a kind of a larger gestalt of understanding as opposed to anything precise or specific or small in a way. And if you know her work, I think it, 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 it's, a good, it's a good aphorism for her work. J.G. Ballard, the late, great J.G. Ballard, here's what he said. I think relationships in the future will be far more ambiguous than they seem now, kind of California spreading across the globe. Um, I love that. Um, love that quote. Um, California, the, the, the land of they, the land of the ambiguous. Uh, every architect there must be interested more in the ambiguous because we live there and draw energy from it. And, and in a world where it's not really very precise, um, seems like uh, being precise is not the, the, the ethos that one might be interested in practicing. And when you look at these images, especially these artificial images uh, you know, from, a, from a helicopter, you sort of see what pretty much reads as a, as a, as a horizontal sprawl landscape, classic 20th century. Now, each one of these sort of patches, do I have a... A pointer by your chance? <laughs> <laughs> no, no pointer. Okay. You have a cherry picker. All right, I will use the counter. Want me a pointer? There you go. Jeff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, no pointer. So you look at the patchwork of the landscape. Um, the, the suburbia in the lower left, uh, Sepulveda Basin, a flood zone, you got the 101, um, you got the 134, they have their own pathways and trajectories. Like Baudrillard said, we don't know if the freeway sort of cut through the landscape or whether the landscape was articulated by the freeways. But at one level, all these kinds of lines and feel, theoretically, like a kind of strange quilt, must add up to some logic, even if traffic jams and confusion, and visually it's fuzzy and vague, something must be accurate uh, underneath it all. I'm going to show you a few projects that on the one hand, uh, I think relative to the conference, talking about the idea of architecture as a kind of, has it been uh, over-moralized uh, because of, um, well, you can fill in the blank, because of uh, uh, frivolity because of uh, an agenda for uh, the aesthetic in a, in a post-aesthetic world. Um, 
whatever it may be. But what I want to do is I actually want to kind of talk about the way in which both the architect and also the client is in a way already injecting everything from the arbitrary to the ignorant uh, as a huge factor um, kind of in the, in the condition of the design process. I'll start with Endeavor. Here it is, 54,000 square feet of offices, support spaces. This is what's written down on a piece of paper. Uh, THX uh, rated screening room. We have a site and so forth. This is the real project. Make it energetic because, you know, that's who we are. Loud is okay like a trading floor. It must be a selling emporium. We got to get Adam Sandler and we, we got to sell. But it's got to be white. Oh, and one other thing, and this is the most important thing, we won't care. I could use expletives in there because they did. Um, we won't care if anyone else is like it. Just do whatever you want to do. And uh, if it's going to be a selling emporium, make it a sell selling emporium, but we don't care if everybody loves it as an aesthetic world. Uh, if, you could, if you could clone that client, that would be all you would need. A client who basically says, I don't care about the market, I don't care about uh, the way in which anything that you're proposing has to have a kind of um, cultural relevant re resonance or anything. So here we were at this particular time in 2003 and trying to, um, actually after only one commission besides Gallery Mob, get the continuous surface to literally function and work in Landscapes internally that, you know, on the one hand, are very constricted, um, both by the program and by the building. And so uh, I'll show you a few images that essentially articulate the, the kind of agenda of the, of the project. The continuous surface, which now has undergone a whole series of transformations, both in my own office and I think in, in contemporary culture, um, read in this particular uh, project as a way to um, I think articulate zones programmatically, and you look at these two images, the one on the right uh, is a blank surface with a particular profile that essentially skins a core, um, and that core is like a kind of uh, ellipsis in time, shall we say, nothing goes on, it's a kind of ambient uh, moment. Uh, next to the, the transition of a, of a lobby ceiling, uh, into a vertical surface, uh, morphing into a lobby, uh, another ceiling on the fourth floor. All of which, when you look at the perspectival versus the, uh, or the 3D versus the 2D orientation of the two views, kind of gives you an idea of, of uh, on the one hand, what's going on in the geometry of the project, and also the way in which the graphic uh, nature of the profile of these surfaces, which was always uh, in our office, as important as the nature of the vague sense of continuity, in fact, the graphic limit, uh, which was going to disembody the, 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 the person to essentially make it a kind of um, uh, drawing almost, um, is, is, I think, reaches its kind of apex, at least in this time period, in this particular project. And making it white, of course, uh, the, the, the com comment about the white project, just to kind of make a parenthesis, we got this job, but, you know, like with all the jobs we get, I'm not sure our clients completely, completely love everything that we do. Somehow there's some strange capitulation to something. And they said, well, you know, Neil, I really love Richard Meyer's work. I got it. <laughs> and you know, it's white. And I think. Uh, I like Richard Meyer's work much, much more than I like Tom Main's work, and I think you're somewhere in the middle. <laughs> so, there you go. I, I, can, I can leave now, I guess. Uh, anyway, so the White Project associated with a kind of clinician at work, a kind of, uh, we want something new, but we also want something classical at that level of the new. So the uh, graphics work in a kind of only in one direction, and they're perpendicular to your, to your movement in this um, kind of linear building. We could use all the color and pattern we wanted uh, on these surfaces because they're only wallpaper and paint, which can be uh, switched out. This is the screening room, which is uh, 54 feet on um, Camden Drive in Beverly Hills. And 
I mean, I could go through a more kind of a uh, specific um, kind of set of ways in which these images articulate. Um, I think the visual perception of uh, both the, the, the nature of the precise and, and the ambiguous. And I'll go to one image right here. It's sort of the, the Aleph uh, moment <coughs> on the one hand for the project where um, the Cartesian is deeply referenced through the slicing and the bands of the uh, section of the theater. There's three bands, three different uh, ceiling profiles. All they do is sort of lock together and they each have their own agenda for uh, light control and, and uh, controlling view. And that where they obviously, as in the case of this kind of fixed stalactite um, wall, reference the sectional aspect of uh, the trim surface, that floats in a field of a kind of vortex of uh, sort of splintered perspective in a way. So on the one hand, the, the, the project about being accurate and precise relative to, in this particular project, the visual, and the visual having to do with um, the legibility of the profile versus, and, and I, in, in our office we kind of call it stop action, that's the moment of repose and, and, and the moment of fixity against the world of essentially deep space or action. When we don't have a client, which is quite often the case, uh, sadly, um, and you do a competition, then your reading of the program and your reading of the project and your reading of the site, of course, uh, states in this kind of uh, very, very unfiltered kind of way what the real project is. We did a competition, maybe some of you did this year, uh, for Maribor, the second largest city in, in Slovenia, it's about 100,000 people, sort of uh, provincial city, and they did a competition, held a competition for their main uh, public uh, modern art museum. Very, very, very standard program with some uh, public functions like uh, children's museum, cafes, and so forth. And uh, the site was, was fairly charged, so we said it's an old city and they must be pretty conservative, yet we want to accelerate culture, obviously. Okay. So let's make a site responsive building that when you look at it seems deeply unresponsive. Uh, I must, it must, sorry, it, it must be spatially smooth, yet look like it's impositional. So obviously we're working with a kind of dialectic, wondering if we could pull something over on this particular site in the city that made it seem as though it was a perfect fit for the site and be traditional in the way in which it would be site responsive, vis-a-vis uh, -vis architecture at least, but geometrically and materially um, have a kind of sense of, um, a, a, a kind of sense, not a foreboding sense, but a sense that maybe the project's too big. Um, uh, maybe uh, geometrically it's not um, uh, articulated enough, something. And we wanted to kind of problematize the nature of fitness relative to the site, while at the same time completely make a project which we felt we could argue and defend on traditional sense of circulation, uh, of movement, of uh, smoothness for the site. Uh, I don't have a lot of images to, to kind of show you about the site, but uh, to the top of the image, basically that's the old city, the kind of uh, medieval city. Uh, the wall is no longer there, but you can see on the, on the right hand side there's a, there's a bit of a cylindrical tower, this imperious, although very small, judgment power. Um, who knows what was judged and who was judged, but that's the sort of uh, context. There's a river in front of the building for which another competition was held uh, to make this kind of uh, typical uh, promenade. And uh, in many respects, this site lay on this, right on the cusp between uh, the old part of the city and a newer part of the city, which itself wasn't um, kind of built up enough to kind of generate a, a new identity. The site response is so uh, uh, logical, I would say, in, in, in many respects. The view of the um, river has to be sort of understood. So half of the building slopes, um, part of which creates a terrace, as you see on the lower part of the building. And to address a corner, that would be the prime uh, point at which you would enter the site. 
uh, you have a giant roof or, or a porch, basically, that levitates. And you can move through the building uh, up to uh, the northern part of the site, or excuse me, the eastern part of the site, into a proposed housing project, which is the second part of the uh, project, basically. If you look at the plans, uh, you can move through these uh, pieces. There's a, actually an artist uh, and business center, uh, that they called it, at the uh, top of the site. Um, this wedge is an architecture center, and programmatically the rest of the museum uh, is in this larger block, and of course they merge together uh, as you go up. So this kind of Janus-faced nature of the project, uh, on the one hand, let's make uh, uh, one, one, one specific thing about the form of the building is, let's make it fairly uh, rough and kind of prismatic, and let's refine it only in very minor ways and in very, very localized uh, kinds of ways. Maybe capitulate to the nature of media as we do here in this particular screen. So if you look at the project, its form is meant to be uh, problematized by scale uh, here. The main galleries are in this kind of levitating um, building with the mega trusses with an equally large window at the corner, but you can see that the uh, shrink wrapping of the window at the corner is meant to kind of explore some of the same things we had in previous projects about um, the, the nature of, let's say, a five degree, five millimeter thick perforated bee-blasted stainless steel skin that then has the implication of two and three meters uh, of depth. And then meanwhile, overall, the, the, the project's uh, form and geometry, again, is meant to be incredibly sort of um, almost primitive in its uh, main response. Sloping uh, to the uh, river, the levitation at the corner, levitation at the back because essentially the building's symmetrical uh, in terms of its um, kind of site response because of people moving through and underneath the building. And the rest of the gallery is levitating over this uh, business center. And when you look at the project, it merely then becomes a kind of uh, big prism for which all of the local geometry, especially the perforations and the, the kind of pockmarking of the building, with these main voids and windows, uh, two main interior uh, voids, which are circulation spaces, and another one which allows the escalator to move up through this mass. Here's the two sections, uh, essentially two of the self-similar kinds of sections um, pitched in reverse uh, one another. The one on top is the, more or less the, the public space moving from a lower lobby uh, into an intermediate lobby for which a void cutting through that diagonal mass uh, transgresses a major line of structure into uh, the exhibition spaces. And there's the upper lobby. So the, the geometry of the main soffit of the surface of the sloping building, which has this kind of torque in it, then sliced and deeply articulated in this kind of serrated uh, inner skin. The stair moves up, uh, challenged by, the, by the, the, the truss inside. It's at that moment, I think, that kind of all the lessons that we uh, learn in projects like Endeavor come back into to play. Here's the same void looking uh, down uh, into the um, lower lobby coming from the gallery spaces up above. Some details of just how the corner condition, this small sort of bevel, which again is, a, is such a kind of minor, almost uh, unnoticeable way to deal with the corner of such a mass that in itself, it's almost uh, incidental. Uh, at some level, but I'm somehow more interested in, in those issues and problems in relation to the to the kind of shrink wrapping depth that's happening uh, in these windows. The plan is uh, here of the upper gallery spaces, and so these uh, boys manage to just very simply move and transgress beyond this main truss line. There's three uh, large trusses, uh, uh, one in the middle and two at the perimeter uh, of the building. And whereas we have a void uh, that turns into a figure um, within the gallery spaces here. This is the uh, um, corrugated, serrated, uh, perforated aluminum skins in the fritted glass. 
And finally, a void at the back of the building between the gallery, the exterior space below, and the artist studios. We did a series of five bank projects and in, in Japan. And all of these commissions we get are fairly unlikely. And again, um, I'm not sure the world really works the way in which we think it works, which is that there's true obsession for the work of an architect. I think there's a kind of kismet or some weird luck or some conditions that then allow somebody to you know, make a project. And I think in, in almost all of our cases, that's the same thing. This was the second of five banks in Nagoya, and um, 2,000 square meters, an ATM hall on the ground floor, reception, et cetera, private offices, et cetera. Here's what they really said. The people of Nagoya have a word they use to describe themselves in their city, Delago. It's a combination of the words deluxe and gorgeous. Delago. De Can you design a bank that is Delago? That was the commission, and that was what they told us. And in a way, what's pretty interesting, here's where, here's where I wanted to kind of say that the client is already invested with the vague and the ambiguous and the imprecise. They give you the metrics of, of how many square meters and any architect can solve for that. But if somebody becomes interested enough to sort of present uh, a project that almost has to be interpreted around a single word, then for sure you got to believe that it's pretty imprecise as to which way you could go with that, because then you go back to your office and go, well, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in these commercial projects where these are projects for people to make money, there are commercial projects for which, uh, in this particular case, design had better become a kind of added value that would actually um, register in some way as a, uh, beyond pride. It would have to register, in this case, literally in terms of uh, increased profit. We were able to make this second one because the first one we did increased business by 100%. Somehow this cool design had resonated with the youth culture in Shibuya and that world was white, and we chose to make uh, black as the primary device to try to leverage what everybody in, in Nagoya thought was a particular type of style or status uh, that they enjoyed or that they included uh, in their city. And like the, the project I previously just showed you, this is the precursor for a lot of the kind of surface and skin geometry. Up above, it's a skin uh, a screen in front of an existing uh, set of uh, windows. It's five millimeters thick, so we know that at five millimeters and, and to perforate uh, the system there, that's only a kind of visual ergonomic, but by the time that same black surface translates into a, a, what's pretty obvious as a wrapper around a column splitting two vestibules, we want to kind of bevel the surface, we want to give it this kind of uh, clearly articulated collar, uh, we want to change from five millimeters to three uh, meters of depth and mass. We want to accelerate depth by the size of the LEDs uh, that go into the um, vestibule, etc. These are some shots of the uh, interior uh, on the second floor. It's a private banking office. There's no money trans uh, uh, transacted. You go up like a salon, you sit down, have coffee, uh, chat, and so forth. And the argument here, um, when you look at this plan, um, to a certain extent, the metrics of, the, of these banks and projects are pretty much given to us. We weren't sitting around trying to conceive of new ways to uh, organize the space. It was given. And in that sense, clients were deeply invested with an expertise of their own field that made us more the amateur. And then we were given our sort of expert, or expert status at the level of, well, Tell us what it's going to be like. Tell us what this the logo world is going to be because we know that that's the kind of final element which will determine whether or not the functionality of the plan uh, could become a, a, a project which would reach an apex of, of workability. So the plan is what it is, but the ceiling plan essentially became our floor plan and we took advantage of the fact that there's no ADA regulations on a floor plan and you can slope it however you want. And we literally 
uh, I don't know if you flipped it 90, we flipped it 180 and basically did, here's our project. And in many ways, our argument, though, recourse back to a kind of uh, curious modernism. We were hoping that this plan of the ceiling would actually reflect in this kind of dynamic sense of how the building was used. So uh, where the white soffits are aligned, that's the only place where you're essentially transitioning and moving. There's no sedentary activity in that zone. And where they essentially split apart into a field or a surface, that's over the sedentary world. So we were hoping that the ceiling was going to be literally a kind of deep reflection of the ergonomic uh, movement of the space. And that was um, not the conversation that we gave the client. That was somehow feeding our own sense of, of uh, maybe a kind of misplaced moralism, like the ceiling had to tell a story that could potentially become precise, potentially become accurate to what was going on in the space, as opposed to, let's say, just purely atmospheric. Um, we could exploit what is often uh, the situation in Japan, which is low ceiling heights. And the lower the ceiling height, the more it sort of seems like the, the project is like a piece of furniture. And the kind of accuracy of construction and the precision of construction, which of course is, is, is always the case in Japan, we were able to calibrate the way in which radial conditions in these developable surfaces could work from 150 millimeters to 300 millimeter radii and graphically, uh, this space works in one way, which is when you look at the, the brown stuff, that's wood. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's actually, um, it's, it's real veneer, but they put it on like, like wallpaper. That's the way in which they do wood in Japan. But when you look at the fall off of the light uh, in those radii, essentially it's a sort of uh, Mark Rothko against Barnett Newman. Uh, you couldn't be more clear about the liminal conditions between the white soffits, but once you get into the radial condition of the fall off the light in this sort of vague painterly world, we were going for a kind of deep uh, collaboration between those two. This is one in Osaka. Uh, it's a five meter tall space. Some of the same agenda is obviously going on. We did these five within a year, actually. This one is in Ginza. And the reflectivity of the floor and kind of doubling the way in which the soffit works was, was one of the kind of the new um, environmental uh, effects that we got out of um, designing the ceiling and having it actually reflect back consistently onto the floor itself. We did a project in China, like so many architects, uh, 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 with, with trepidation and, and with confusion still have that. It just never clears up. Uh, eight hectares, uh, 200,000 square meters of housing, etc. almost 300,000 square meters of, of project. Tell us the story. Architecture always has a meaning, doesn't it? Can you make something of the special character of Weifang? Now, everybody who's done a project in China, that's what your commission is, um, not the production of floor plates. The production of floor plate, of course, is the kind of the machinery of it all, but in the cross-cultural sort of world of um, logic, and we know other projects and other architects who, who, who articulated either a market necessity for telling stories, because otherwise you don't crack the market, as, because Telling stories to the Chinese client doesn't make them simply feel good. It actually unlocks the project to be built. And there's a big difference between the two. In other words, uh, understanding a story is a form of logic as opposed to a form of uh, a sense of security or love of poetics. And there's a big fault line between those, let's say, in, in, in that particular culture. It just so happens this city, Weifang, which is in Shandong province, is like the windiest city in China. And because of that, it became uh, the world center for kite flying. They've been building and flying kites there for 2,500 years. And uh, here you see some of the images of their annual um, festival. 
It's a small city, uh, more or less, I think two and a half million to three million people. This waterfront is being developed at such light speed. Our project is actually on the other side uh, of this river. Um, and in many respects, you know, it's nauseatingly the same as so many projects uh, that you see landscapes being essentially torn down. This is the typical type of uh, housing slab that uh, is, is going on not only in that city but, but in all of China. And here's our site. Um, pay attention to the grain of the city which is running uh, east and west to the top of the image is north. And we have this uh, very, very large site across from a park um, on a riverfront right in the heart of the city. Now what we thought we would try and do was uh, offer one thing, one of a particular kind of, um, let's say, straightforward architectural logic, which we hoped would somehow simultaneously satisfy the demand for storytelling. And the first thing we did was we rejected the housing uh, slab oriented uh, in the way in which the grain in the city works. Uh, with the idea that east and west sunlight coming into a north-south uh, oriented building uh, would, would be the best environmental response, as well as a series of small footprint point towers which would allow corner units, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They demanded a 50-story, 150-meter tall tower uh, on the uh, corner across from the park. So this is what we uh, worked on and, and presented to them in, in, in the first phase. And I hesitate to tell you that we also said that this was like a kite. Uh, it's <laughs> tails <laughs> ground. But we did. <laughs> well, we get the kite part, but I'm sorry, the uh, typology doesn't work in China and you must make slabs like the rest of the city. And only you're left to do is uh, pack the number of square meters that we need on the site, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the project on the one hand, you could say from this point on, might have gotten worse. Uh, and and it's, it's open enough and interesting enough to kind of talk about that. Or one could say, this was the classic ask for 200% to somehow get 100% um, uh, out of the project. And, and if one retains any sense of optimism, that's what uh, you have to do to kind of look at the, the project in a way. So the nature of the precise um, actually became incredibly dominant relative to the, the kind of metrical sense of building in China. But you know, building in China with north-facing balconies and south-facing balconies and floor-through units, probably at one level, environmentally doesn't make that much sense. You've got a cold side and a warm side, and you've got a, you don't have the, the nature of, uh, let's say, daily symmetry of, of the, the sun passing around a, a unit oriented in the correct way. But that's a long-standing tradition in, in China. So we were left to try to essentially work on a kind of uh, slab typology uh, at one level dominated by much of what they understood as being uh, uh, kind of a marketable uh, project. These are the latest, uh, the latest images of the slab typology uh, that we're working on and also a new version of the, of the tower uh, which we decided to make dissimilar from the rest of the project since we were no longer uh, necessarily bound by the by the storytelling of, of uh, the kite and the kite city, like a Hitchcock movie, it just became a MacGuffin and then forgotten, so that we could just simply move forward with. It's a mixed-use tower with uh, apartments, hotel, and office space, and these are some rotational images of. What we're just trying to do with the uh, aluminum skin is to work on some seaming techniques uh, at a super large scale. An even larger project with an even more strange uh, condition is one that we're working on, almost finished with right now. It's a limited competition. There are four offices, two American offices and two Russian offices for 200 hectares. Uh, 200 hectares is one kilometer by two kilometers. 597 acres, and it's middle-class housing for 45,000 people. Uh, 
uh, in a city about 20 miles south of uh, St. Petersburg. So this phase for the housing is for 45,000 middle class Russians. Of course it must be warm and cozy or will not sell. Yet what I'm building now is not contemporary. There's the first phase and I'll show you some images of it. So what you must do must be different. How different though, I'm not sure. So the client is already invested in, in the imprecise. Uh, ranging either from the ignorant form of the imprecise or uh, a dilettante form of the imprecise as in I'll know it when I see it, which is really the hallmark of the dilettante. Uh, somehow understanding a world and having an eye enough to kind of go, that's the one. But we're, we're really not sure uh, about this kind of condition. Here's the location of this city. Pushkin is is an old city, it's actually 200 years old, but it's more or less a kind of commuter town. And there's the center of uh, Pushkin, and there's our site. It's uh, almost as big as the city itself. Well, we went through about 40 or 50 different schemes uh, for one million square meters of housing, and dealing with uh, the project of what was new, what was suburban, what was urban, uh, what was the identity of the city where, by the way, there's really very little retail. So you can't treat it like a, a city in its, in its pure uh, programmatic form of diversity. It really is a kind of drive-in, drive-out uh, world. But yet the impression of what was urban, of course, issues of street edge, street profile, the nature of, of uh, the boulevard, et cetera, uh, heterogeneity, um, district, neighborhood, and so forth. So we explored literally ad infinitum uh, as many types of uh, forms of grids, both repetitive and, and irregular, um, ways in which open space would be uh, sort of deeply exiled into territories almost that wouldn't be uh, controlled as park <coughs> Um giant uh, mega repetitive uh, figures, and so forth. So what we ultimately decided in this particular project, um, and, and, and by the way, the, the, the imprecise thing more or less resides kind of in, in the realm of, of the demands of the project, not at the level of metrics. Again, it was a million square meters of housing, a high school, a middle school, elementary school, four kindergartens, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But really the, the kinds of issues were about urban identity. And in this case, what we decided to do was to make buildings uh, uh, with parking garages underneath them. Um, producing on the one hand what one might imagine even more um, ambiguous world, because the suburban world usually is littered with parking lots. You see the, the, the uh, kind of the world of parking very, very much exposed in North America, for instance. If you put the parking underneath the building and you sort of hide it, you obviously liberate uh, landscape and, and uh, ground form and so forth. But at one level, without the nature of the commercial, um, one isn't really sure how this world works. Um, and we can reference even Corbusier's work with the slab in the park and so forth. We simply took the orientation of the grid and said we would never have a long, long boulevard in the site. And we would use radial transition to just simply to kind of break down uh, let's say this idea of, of um, repetitive and kind of <coughs> maniacal kind of sense of the, the, the street. So um, to a certain extent we're trying to do the most with the, the least and we developed a series of uh, building typologies to try to dramatize uh, difference because that was one of the things that was in theory asked for which was how to battle suburban homogeneity with a kind of um, local form of difference. And so within two or three different building typologies, we're working on uh, building skins all based on prefabrication. This is a precast concrete embossed uh, building with, um, this is the courtyard on top of the parking. Another type of precast uh, system generating another kind of hypergraphic. Folded metal panels, again, changing the grain uh, from horizontal to vertical. 
another horizontal grain with kind of three-dimensionally uh, canalized uh, painted metal facade. And here's some uh, kind of assemblies of these kind of forced diversity on the one hand of the making a landscape of diversity within one office. We were forced to kind of manufacture different techniques, uh, uh, visual um, kind of compositional techniques relative to the uh, buildings within the same level of, and type of uh, construction logic. <coughs> Here's a, here's a shot in between uh, these larger buildings. You're going into the parking garage uh, below. There's actually a, a law in Russia that says you've got to have two and a half meters up or away from uh, parking. So these buildings, by definition, have to be levitated above the parking garage. Maybe kind of an interesting way, expanding the, the way in which the uh, exterior space becomes disciplined by the building footprint. Point-loaded uh, buildings without parking underneath, um, some small retail zones, and ultimately the production uh, nearly instantly of a city itself, but a city only in the sense of mass, probably less in, in the sense of uh, urban life. Kindergarten, uh, uh, one of the kindergartens that we designed. And finally, we decided that um, this is really the, the world of uh, uh, Pushkin. It's, it's basically six months in darkness with snow on the ground the whole time. And uh, we had to kind of feel comfortable, and this was the real moment where I felt comfortable with the proposition of the project becoming what did it mean to be truly sort of middle class and, and literally gray and part of the uh, world of everyday life. And I'll just conclude with HL23. Uh, which is an even more curious kind of relationship between the precise and, and the bank. 36,000 square feet, nine uh, apartments, two duplexes, a ground floor retail. This is a bit of a lie because we didn't even know that's what the exact program was. Uh, our client came to us and said this. The project I want to build is too big for the site zoning. I want you to design something unusual that will overcome that problem. There are lots of politics involved, however. <laughs> so, on the one hand, it sounds pretty much like a doom and gloom situation. On the other hand, it sounds like, you know, the ultimate project because the client is supplying the, uh, the dare for you. And in many respects, how big, how high, how tall, how much, what, how were we going to do it, was all the, the, the imprecise aspect that we were, we were dealing with. So the site is on 23rd Street at the High Line, and from the very beginning we were dealing with this non-conformist project. We, we knew that it had to be uh, bigger than the allowable volume for the site. And by the way, we weren't building, we're not building more FAR, because uh, actually some of the FAR for the site was exported to another project. That was one of the kind of hardships that the client sort of presented, which is the special zoning of West Chelsea minimizes the amount of, of uh, square meters you could build, making the project <coughs> virtually un, un, undevelopable, which it was for basically all the years until, um, essentially until Manhattan turned into Tokyo, which is every square meter became worth you know millions of dollars. Um, Japan, you know. You can sell noodles on, on, a, on a corner and make money. And in Manhattan, it suddenly become, it, it had become literally that kind of level of, of uh, potentiality to the site. Here's the site in 2005, looking south. Um, a floor, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a site that on the one hand, um, you know, it's, it's pretty unthinkable. We, we had a similar sort of site that we built or designed a, an as of right building in 2001. This building was built because of 9-11. Uh, it's on Union Square North, uh, 17th Street. Client pushed all the FAR up into the building. We uh, adhered to the setback and the kind of wedding cake nature. We could hold the exterior because we were within the uh, building volume. The front of the building is a vertical surface. It adheres to the um, street wall, et cetera, et cetera, using a, a kind of uh, tessellation in the uh, 
uh, crit pattern, et cetera. So we had some sense about what these sites were like. And this is really a diagram of the project. Um, 15 foot setback. We knew that we had to push out because going into the 15 foot setback was going to give us the maximum amount of uh, new square meters. Site uh, obviously completely impacted at one level. This is in construction, obviously, and, and uh, it's right near you know the river, and it's a horrible uh, uh, problem with uh, groundwater. So I'll show you some images of the project. It's this project since 2006 has had a, a an open media life. Um, it's, it's been living for five years now. It's been in three or four museum shows. It's sort of uh, uh, with with renderings of such photorealistic uh, kind of qualities. Many people thought it was already built before. And if you go see the building, some might say it's the only building that somehow lives up to the promise of, of you know the renderings. And at that point, I just want to say one other thing about the nature of the precise, going back to the beginning of the talk. I think that the precise has generated heightened expectations for everything. Heightened expectations that the digital will produce somehow fidelity, that in the development of machines, in the development of, of industry, and in the development of, of uh, technology where in theory there's less hand, on the stuff that you're making, and that if there's less hands on it, then the holy grail of getting to the point of technology transfer, like building a car, then the buildings must be going into that. And there's a, there's a kind of fomenting of that, I think, with the precise and with the digital that heightens these expectations, uh, for which even talking about the nature of the photorealistic renderings relative to the building is an example. I think of that heightened sense of expectations, mainly really in this project, but it's been an interesting one to kind of think about. So these are a number of images, obviously, that um, do a number of things. These are shots that are only oriented on the X and the Y axis of uh, the grid of the city, obviously here down uh, 23rd Street. This is oriented, obviously, north and south. It's not on uh, uh, 10th Avenue. And so the relationship in, in both of these images between the east facade, which just because of the position of the camera, you can read the building, but it's pretty flat and pretty oblique, and you, you understand the nature of the ambiguous depth of, of that facade. The north facade is completely straight and completely flush, but again, with a 14 millimeter lens, you get a certain amount of uh, distortion. But part of the disciplining of these images is only shooting it uh, in, a, in a cardinal view, uh, not this one, this is one of the old renderings. This shows, obviously, the relationship of the high line to the, to the building. Uh, but what happens to the, to, the, to the mass and to the surface um, relative to 2D and 3D conditions, it's much, much different um, in these worlds than on the high line. We have a captive audience on the high line. Um, like a kind of body becoming zoom lens, you just keep getting closer and closer and closer to it. And you don't need to change anything because the building is the thing which is, which is um, essentially becoming larger. And as you know, in terms of visual perception, the closer something uh, uh, comes to your, to, to your eye, then the more a certain type of peripheral vision is going to start taking over as opposed to uh, looking at something in a particular type of scale, like a logo printed in black ink on a white page, where your vision can look at that and kind of understand absolutely the precise liminal conditions of it. The High Line was a built-in uh, uh, miracle for us in terms of this project, because we knew that, like opposite from the images that you sort of saw in the field, these views would become super specific relative to the nature of the graphic project. These are some uh, process images, and uh, the main section of the project is where we had a kind of sense of arbitration. We applied for eight waivers, we got seven. The one was a political pawn to sort of unlock the other seven. It's too long of a story to kind of tell about that. But when you see these images on the high line, especially as you, you know, kind of move forward to the building, clearly it, 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 it emerges as a deeply kind of complex prism in relation to uh, the long views up and down the high line where the profile of the building, which is cantilevering over the high line, along with the kind of frit um, doppelganger of structure in the 
glass is the thing which is trying to articulate something as being very, very precise. But the overall tectonic project is only a resultant of guesswork, uh, of total guesswork. Guesswork in terms of how far could we go over the high line before they say no? How far back before they say no? How far uh, of one particular sort of inclination before we said no as an office? Uh, where our own sort of visual limits hit uh, political limits and so forth. This project is completely uh, a disciplined project from a material point of view, but it's only the resultant of that, which is, has nothing to do with, with um, delivering program or delivering service in a way. One of the optical things we're dealing with is non-spandrel glass. Uh, that you see here. So we get rid of at least a set of lines that uh, would essentially strike the building horizontally. And the nature of the diagonals, which essentially runs from three to four floors, makes the building appear to be more like a four floor or a stack of four chunks rather than a stratification of 14 floors. And you can see the detail on, on the left uh, of that. These are the uh, panels in, in China, and uh, they're made like Lamborghinis. And this is a kind of a long-standing moment of saying, you can, you can make a factory, you can make multiple iterations of something, but buildings aren't even made at this level of repetition. So you know that they're even more handmade than even something like this. And so if it's more handmade than you think, and if you look at these steel frames, these steel frames are, yes, they're, they're extruded, but, and they're set up on jigs, but basically it's a guy welding each corner uh, of the steel frame, and they've got to deal with distortion and, and the way in which the welds work and so forth. So the, the, the nature of, of the expectation of the delivery of digital information across landscapes finally does uh, uh, really kind of resolve itself at the level of the bank. Uh, and if the bag is the hand in our terms, then that's what it is. Just some construction process. One anecdote here is uh, these are the dyes milled in Argentina for the east metal panels. Um, we made a mock-up in MDF. We painted it in a body shop. It was perfect. We sent it down. That was the geometry. They milled the panels. And what happened was, after stamping the stainless steel, uh, the, this is a, a reasonably good one, but before that, the deformation is so minor at the ends of the panels that the first ones actually only had a deformation about half of what we expected, and the shape memory of the steel collapsed back to flat because the profile of the die was so sort of minor. So the, atomic structure of the stainless steel could not be predicted uh, by anyone. So we actually had to go back, add a piece of steel to each one of the dies, three mill it, and it was four days for each one, and there's four different panels, so that was 20 days. In And you know how we decided how much? We just sort of looked at it and said, eh, how about that much? <laughs> and that's what we did. <laughs> I'll just show you some. These, these were taken last weekend. In the end, what's, what's kind of interesting about these panels, though, is, is that though they were deeply worked by the human hand, they are probably the most uh, super consistent, <coughs> super accurate, uh, super aligned, the way in which the deformation goes across the uh, vertical joint. It's, it's nearly perfect. So uh, at one level, it was only that way because everything was uh, basically mocked up in the factory and put together and adjusted by hand. OK, I think that's it. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you very much.
bring back after the president on the battle panel. Okay. Like that story. That's a great story. Uh, the Argentinian completely compassionate office that made this uh, factory. He said, you know, Neil, the stainless steel is a, it's a diabolical. <laughs> We would have done it in aluminum, no problem, because the atomic structure of it is not as robust. It obviously has a different kind of lifespan. And we use we use stainless steel. Um, our, our client was insistent on it because of the duration of, of material and quality, the material and so forth. And yet, its its strength and hardness is just it's so beyond compare to obviously zinc and softer. Materials which would have taken even, you know, just a millimeter or two. Because the deformation obviously goes maximum only one inch in the middle, so it's it's not very deep, and it, it moves out to you know zero on the end. And in in essence, if it's if it's deforming even a millimeter, and that's part of the figure, um, we had to essentially exaggerate that one millimeter. We didn't actually have to exaggerate as much in the middle. Um, and it was totally analog, and we literally tried to be as empirical as we could about it. But. I thought there was a moment where the engineer calculated a kind of bounce back effect from uh, post tension. That was on the structural frame. And then you had to change all the windows or something like that? No, no. I, I love, this. I love uh, stories about engineers screwing up. Any of those you can tell. Jeff is referring to. Um, like any building, but this one, because it's not a box, means that with prefabricated um, prefabricated materials, everybody's operating with tolerance. And steel structure, as we all know, operates with, with tolerance. Usually, uh, normal tolerances are two and a half inches in and two and a half inches out from where it's supposed to be, essentially where the digital model asks it to be. And if a building of this type migrates one way or the other as it goes up. These parts which are made in the factory, which of course are operating under much, much smaller tolerances, the mega panel for the glass isn't going to be plus or minus four inches, it's going to be plus or minus four millimeters. So if one has a rough tolerance and the other one has a tight tolerance, that's a recipe for you know disaster at one level. So our erection engineer said, okay, let's erect the building the first seven floors, and uh, we're going to guy wire the whole thing, because um, until you pour the concrete in the slabs, the build the, that part of the structure is not done yet. In other words, the thing's going to move around. So the second, uh, the second seven floors were put together, and our sloping columns, the erection engineer put in uh, he over cambers the diagonal uh, columns because basically when the thing was going to be finally loaded uh, with the concrete and it was also the loading of the, the envelope, it's going to move. And it didn't move. So, you know, you're running, you're running the calculations, you're, you're sort of thinking about, you know, predicting uh, the way in which matter is going to work. And, and trust me, we had every consultant in the world working on this building to try to, you know, prevent it from doing anything screwy because we were just going to get in trouble if it didn't if it didn't work. Now that um, that was rectified because we actually were able to take the guy wires and actually pull the building again. And by the time we poured in the the, the seven floors and the diaphragms of the floor plates were together, it was close enough. You know, to our tolerances, that you know, the building was going to be um, was going to be okay. But this has been a game of millimeters, and and um, this project basically inspired the whole you know lecture in a way. You know, relative to um, also the promise of digital culture. Um, you know that we write about and think about, and we we you know we teach in a way. But um, I'd like to maybe over the the course of the time, 
over the next couple of days, kind of talk about this idea of, uh, at least one of the things about heightened expectations, which is for me a, 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 a curious one, which we've placed on our own office, but also I think media culture has also fomented in a way, maybe because of renderings or maybe because of um, just some sense of understanding that we all say we've gained more control in the process of building something. That's typically what we're saying now, as opposed to having wood and stucco and 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 uh, a lot of caulking, you know, kind of carry today. But there aren't any more questions. Can you go back to your very first, thing? very first, like not the title, but the title of the lecture? Because it's one professional to another. I'm very curious about the detail of it. Very the very beginning. It scared me a little bit. I wanted to ask you that. The one in the laboratory? Like, even like the title. Okay. It says lecture number 270. <laughs> 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 Do you really count? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as, as a polemic, of course, you, you, as a polemic, you'd want to go, oh, yeah, it's, it's misguided. That's all I want. <laughs> <laughs> but sure. Um, you know, even in the, even in the 90s, even in the, even in the blurry world, um, when, 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 uh, kind of before, really, Jeff and I were having a conversation, it was more with Sanford uh, in the early 90s about, you know, um, how was the philosophy of science shifting into um, you know, the realm of uh, the new Einsteinian relative field and the electrotexture and what were the new set of codes that you were going to kind of bring to the work. And um, yeah, so there I was sort of still drawing super clear profiles and making sure the curves oscillated perfectly and everything sort of lined up and they were loosely and sloppily extruded as I said and so that there was this sense that I was trying to hybridize um, the, the same ambition everybody had for the nature of the formless but I could never give myself over to that project all the way just because of a, a certain probably maniacal sense of the concrete that I know is invested in who I am and what I do as an architect, and, and finitude is a, is a serious thing. I guess the, the challenge I would say is, does that necessarily kill mystery? You know, I don't think it does. I don't think that precision is gonna, uh, I think precision in some ways, vis-a-vis -vis the digital, what might be going on now, allows a certain type of form making that has vague or has references to, to the vague and to the you know to the unclear and to the formless uh, because of uh, um, the way in which parametrics work at one level. Um, 
and it carries on a certain type of tradition, I would say. Speaking of Ghadar and all that's new becomes, you know, a tradition. Um, and I, I just think that, you know, for me, it's it's a bit like it's still some of the same agendas, you know, going on regardless of the tools and and, and so forth. And um, this is this is a particular brand of refinement that hopefully doesn't close the door on on. Uh, you know, visual perception or mystery or misreading or anything, you know, that's profound, you know, at one level in, in architecture. Um, but I, I would say as a, as a polemic, let's say, let's go with, yeah, it's, it's preventing architecture, just for the sake of argument. Isn't it the reflected ceiling plan of the bank, doesn't that become the street plan in Christian city? Yes. Yes. So there's a mystery. There you go. <laughs> That's a good read. Okay. Okay. Just one more to Go to Maribor. Okay. <laughs> I'm showing Stan's tomorrow night. Did you see it? I know Stan's project. Yes. Very interesting and very yes. By the way, I'm also amazed at how you should never show 2001 and Endeavor together. It's really clear. You ripped off 2000. <laughs> <laughs> he originated it. Oh, we that, sorry. <laughs> For a second there, I thought he ripped it off. <laughs> okay. There's this one really strange point. Go to it. Let me just slip through the slogan. I'm sorry, everybody. But... Ah, okay, go back for Where is this other one? The lower right? Yeah. Where it comes down and lifts like. Two inches up the top? What's that about? Like, you can't miss this rendering, right? No, no, no. What's that about? I mean, that's um, a strange detail. It is. Um, as I was sort of saying, I, I read this building as, as uh, this kind of dialectic between pushing, I'm, I can't, I could show you all of the massing schemes that we did for the project, from high rises to low rises and, and everything else. The, the, the general mass of the building is, is basically primitive, I would argue. Fold here, fold there, levitate in between, walk underneath. Everything else in terms of the way in which the um, eye or the body is going to essentially get close to the building and interact with it, levitating that corner is supposed to essentially work against the, the sort of bigger reading of the primitive and the, and the weight of the project. Um, so that's a classic one, which is levitation. The others are some of the issues of, of mass and depth, at the kind of shrink wrapping at the window to, you know, perforated skins, which are just kind of brain screen um, situations. I mean, for me, this is some of the territory that I think is going on in, in other people's work that I'm trying to kind of explore, you know, on my own terms. Or the. Uh, You see where the, the mass sort of hovers above the sloping glass mm -hmm. and they handle it without. I can't tell you how long I worked on that on that radial corner of these two cones coming together into a point. Um, that would then still allow that as a kind of figure which would have fall off and hot spot and I mean the bee blasted stainless steel I learned from Frank. If you these not all yeah. and the nature of that is an impositional building. Uh, but, a, but a building that massages light and is completely uh, captivating for me. So, but is it, I mean, were you thinking of the Le Bon dance here? I mean, the reason it, it does actually hover. Remember how Le Bon yeah. sort of sinks into the top of the ground? And it turns a, a project of incredible scale into something even more weightless. I that, one, that one, though, still feels heavy because it's burned up in a landscape mm -hmm. and it feels like it of the landscape, there's still some bunker mentality. Uh, whereas I think this one's a little bit different. But very nice question. You know, we just continue the zero for life in, in uh, competitions. <laughs> okay, thanks very much.